Welcome back to the Flipping Junkie podcast. Today, I've got a good friend, DeRay Ola Leye. And uh, I nailed the name. <laughs> I, I hope, right? We, we were talking about that, practicing it before the, the show. It's amazing how a, a name that you're not used to saying can be kind of difficult to, to get right. I guess with so many syllables, too, it's kind of tricky, right? Absolutely. But you nailed it. Oh, good, man. All right. DeRay is a real estate uh, investor, business coach. And as a former big four accountant, he has audited some of the biggest names in real estate. After big four to gain financial experience, he went on to consult for a $26 billion fund manager and analyze complex investment vehicles. After an unfulfilled and overwhelming stint in corporate, Dure found cash flow real estate as a means to quit his day job and travel the world. So that sounds like the, the transformation a lot of people listening to this really, really are itching to make. And we'll do whatever it takes to do it. So I'm glad to have you on the show today to talk about that. Now, he's the, the founder of the Before the Millions educational coaching company, spanning its reach to over 100 plus con uh, countries worldwide. The platform's mission is to help everyday professionals become savvy investors and create that lifestyle business. Over the past few years, DeRay has personally coached over 500 students and been able to help many of them create financial freedom, travel the world, and make an impact while enjoying life and making the world a better place. I love it. That's, uh, you know, for the, my software company, that's the vision is enjoy life. And that's, you know, it's not just for the team and the people working with me, but it's what we're trying to do for real estate investors, because there, there are a lot that get into the, the trap of, of doing and building a business that, that they're working for, you know, even though they own it, they end up in that trap, but I'm curious to to dig into your story. You know, if if for for anybody that doesn't know you or hasn't heard of you, can you share your background and then getting into the the real estate investing? Absolutely. Well, first off, I appreciate you for having me on. I'm super excited, excited to speak with your listeners and hopefully provide some value. Um, and yeah, like you said, I uh, I come from a corporate background, and I know many, many of your listeners probably come from a similar corporate background. I was told when I was in college to go get a good, high-paying job, and um, because I was good with numbers, people pushed me towards the accounting world, and there was nothing wrong with it. I, I worked hard. I, I strived to do my best in college so I can get into what they like to call the Princetons, the Yales, the Harvards of accounting. It's called the Big Four, and if you get into one of these firms, you're pretty much set for life. At least that's what they like to tell you. And you work your way up in these firms, you you work for about 10 to 15 years, and then you become what's called a partner, right? So you get to buy into the company. And at that point, you're making minimum half a million dollars a year. So this was the plan for me. And I knew that, hey, all I had to do was work at this firm until I was 30 or 35. And I was, you know, it's going to be making half a million dollars a year. So I started down that path. And uh, year one, uh, I was in for a rude awakening. And um, again, with these firms, um, it's kind of like bribe tactics that are built into their system, right? You have a lot of mixers, you had a lot, you have a lot of soirees, you have a lot, you have the Amex card, you're traveling like almost 24 seven, you know, free lunches and dinners. And, you know, it's, it's almost like the red carpet treatment, but at the same time, you're working 70 hours a week, right? You're not controlling your own time. You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in, in, in the house on a Sunday thinking, Hey, I got to go to work tomorrow, you know, clock in and, you know, whatever the case may be. And my boss calls me and says, Hey, you got to fly to San Francisco to do an audit for three weeks, pack your bags. I'm like, well, I got a wedding next week, or I got, you know, I got family, I got things to do. And it really doesn't matter, right? You don't control your time. You don't control your schedule. So um, I was discontent very, very fast, very, very fast. I thought that there was no way, especially with uh, my personality, I have been the type of person all my life who's wanted to explore. Uh, I'm an avid traveler. If you check out my Instagram, I love going to different countries and taking sabbaticals and going away for a month or two and just kind of kicking back and relaxing. And um, I even remember when I accepted my full-time job offer at the big four firm, I said, hey, I have one stipulation for me to start working with you guys. I need to take the year off so that I can go travel the world because I believe once I start working, I'm not going to get that opportunity again. So I took the year off. I went to Italy. I went to Dubai. I went to a lot of different places. And again, just to tell you a little bit more about my personality. So when I started working, I was like, oh man, like this is my first real full-time job. I'm working 70 hours a week. I don't control anything. And um, I became very depressed, Danny, very, very fast, very fast. I remember my first year, or actually my first paycheck, um, I got my check and um, 
I remember what they told me I was going to be getting paid <laughs> and I got my check and it wasn't what they told me. It was like half of what they told me. I was, I was shocked. I was like, wait, I, I added the numbers and I was just like, wait, like what's going on? Like half my check is missing. Um, so I called my mom and I was like, mom, like something's going on. Like, do I need to talk to HR? Like, the, you know, there's this line item, it's called taxes and it's taken away half of my money. What, what is this? And she's like, yeah, you're an adult. That's it's, it's the real world. That's what happens. And I was just, I was just so blown away that, this is how we're, we're operating. Not, I mean, it wasn't just me. It was everyone, like everyone in corporate, everyone who's a professional, everyone who's an adult, right? You're paying 30% in taxes, 40% in taxes. Some, I mean, upwards of 50% in taxes. If you really yeah. think about it, when you include sales tax and all the other taxes that you're paying outside of your checks, right? So I was just like, man, so you mean to tell me that I'm working for six months out of the year? Cause again, 50% in taxes, I'm working for six months out of the year just to pay the government. I was like, who does that? And I thought about it, I was like, well, literally everyone. And I was like, that, that's crazy. And then, you know, when you're fresh out of college, you have student loans, you have, you know, um, you got a mortgage maybe, or maybe if you don't have a mortgage, you got a, you got a rent payment, um, you got credit card statements, um, cell phones, all that. So, so the second half of the year, I'm thinking like, I'm paying all these loans back my auto loan. Like all of my money is going to Uncle Sam the first half of the year, the second half of the year, all of my money is going to the bank. So mm -hmm. I'm not really making any money. I'm not being fulfilled by the work that I'm doing because again, I'm an external auditor. So I'm auditing the financial statements of some of the biggest real estate companies in the world, but all I'm doing is adding one plus one equals two, making sure that the numbers are right. And they're using those statements to go make millions if not billions of dollars. I don't see any of that money. I don't even see any of that gratitude, right? So again, I'm a pencil pusher in a completely different building. So I'm not getting the satisfaction of, oh, this is what we did and this is how we helped this company grow. We don't see any of that. So there's no satisfaction, there's no money and there's no fulfillment. So I was just like, why am I here? Like, am I gonna do this for the next 40 years of my life? I couldn't do it for another, I couldn't do it for another <laughs> one year. And yeah. I was just like, how are people doing this year in, year out? Like it, it makes, it literally, Danny, it made no sense to me. I, I felt like things were backwards. And I was just like, am I the only one who like, feels like this like why is everybody else okay with this why is everybody else okay with this i was looking around and nobody else was questioning what was going on 50 percent in taxes not being fulfilled um all those bribes i mean again we get free dinner upwards of 50 dollars, 100 dollars, steak dinners lobsters and all of that but you think about the only reason you're getting free dinner is because you're working till 11 o'clock at night you're working till 12 o'clock at night you're working till one two three Right. So obviously they're going to bribe you and me. I'm a, I'm a health nut. I'm a health freak. So I was getting super fat. Right. Like working that late, not ever working out. Like my lifestyle was just totally terrible. Yeah. And again, I, can't, I got into this depressed state uh, so much so that it started affecting my work. And um, there, there came a point where I knew, Danny, that I was going to get let go. Like I started to feel the 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 aura like, hey, like things are going left. Um, I started not getting put on as many assignments. I started noticing things were changing. And, you know, I talk about this story a lot, a lot of, a lot of different stories during this time. Um, but, but ultimately, I realized that I needed to start looking into something else, where there was another job, where there was becoming an entrepreneur, uh, starting a business, whatever the case may be, I realized I needed to look into something else. Because if I was to get fired from that job, I had nothing to fall back on. Um, and these were just early rumblings, early thoughts, but I didn't really take any action because I was like, eh, we'll see what happens. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out. Or maybe I'll stay, or maybe, you know, I'll just get another job. And, um, a year after I knew I was going to get fired again, they, they were going to fire me for an entire year. And they just kind of, they just kind of towed at the line. They just kind of waited for the right time. Like imagine knowing you're going to get fired for an entire year, what type of anxiety that you yeah. have. It'd be different if you like knew you were going to get fired and you get fired the next month. Now, had you heard things about that? I mean, you actually heard somebody tell you, okay, okay. So was right. it so I would I would receive reviews and they would say, hey, um, this is what needs to be worked on in the next six months or one year, uh, so that you can do X, Y, and Z. And uh, again, I, I get into this a lot. I didn't want to get into it now, but ultimately, uh, I received a review or mid year or a year in review, and they were like, hey, if you you know do X, Y, and Z, and you you know perform at your best, and you hit these marks, then um, then we'll be sure that to make sure that you get a promotion, you get a raise, and all this stuff. You know that year came around. Like I said, I waited a whole year, and I hit all the marks that they told me to hit. Danny, I hit all the marks that they told me to hit. I served on maybe three different engagements, which is three different clients. Uh, help them build out their financial statements, all that good stuff. And at the end of that year, they still told me, hey, DeRay, I think this is just not the best fit for you. It's time to let you go. And I was just like, what? 
like, like you guys made a promise to me. Like I should have made you guys sign the contract. Like, this is what you told me to do X, Y, and Z. I did exactly X, Y, and Z. And I still, I'm still being let go. And, you know, at that point I, I, I knew that I was in trouble. I was in trouble. A few months before that, this woman, uh, I call her my guardian angel, but this woman, she was a year ahead of me. Uh, she hands me this book and mind you, Danny, I hadn't read a single book as an adult. I'm not ashamed to say that. I hadn't read a single book as an adult. I remember, um, I was probably like 24 at the time, but I remember since like the age of 16, 17, I tried to eat, read The 48 Laws of Power by uh, Robert E. Green. That's the wrong and, one um, to start with. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'd be on planes, I'd be on trains, and I'd be in different places. I'd always just, I'd be in bed. Um, I, I could just never get past the first chapter. I just wasn't a reader. Like after high school, I was just like, there's no, I mean, I don't, there's no purpose and I'm, I'm okay. Um, but she hands me this little book and she says, DeRay, you know, like something told, something like it's calling on me to tell you to read this book. I said, mm -hmm. huh? Like, why me? She's like, I don't know. It's just something like I've been reading this book and on, on the way to work and I just think you should read it. It's like, okay, whatever. No, and I'm probably not going to read the book. I mean, I've tried to read, but it's not for me. Um, the book is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. She handed, she doesn't hand me the book physically, but I buy the book on Audible. And uh, Danny, I read that book probably in one sitting and um it was the it was kind of like a, a bible or like a manuscript or 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 like a translator that's a better it was like a translator because there were there were feelings and emotions and ideas in my head that i didn't know were real i didn't know were possible i didn't know that there were people out in the world that were actually doing these things right i would think of concepts and i'm like man that'd be cool if that was actually something you can do and I'd read this book. And again, from my background, I hadn't been exposed to real estate. I hadn't been exposed to investing like this. So I was just like, whoa. Like, yes, I'm auditing the financial statements of some of the biggest real estate mm -hmm. companies in the world. But I just, you just don't think it's something that the everyday person can do. And I read the book and I was like, this is like the language I've been trying to speak for the past year. Yeah. This is like the hidden, I don't know. It, it, just, it just revealed everything that I, I kind of thought in my head, but I didn't know was, was a real thing. Yeah, that book is, you know, it's, it's probably the number one, probably 80% of real estate investors when asked what book, you know, got you going in this. And it's like rich dad, from poor dad. And I almost wonder if there, there can't be another one of those ever written. You know what I mean? It was just like put in a way that got that, that showed you this whole completely different side of, of what life could be like you know, regarding work, right. And, yeah. and how, yeah. how to look at what you're doing. And, you know, like you said, you know, going into corporate world and looking at the taxes and, and how much that was coming out of your check and just like, wow, like I'm doing all this work and I'm not even getting half of it. And, you know, and then not enjoying finding fulfillment in that. And then seeing something where somebody's showing you this thing that fires you up and, and I can't help it. I love the fact that you said you didn't really enjoy reading and you tried to read the 48, laws of power or whatever that was. I still haven't read that book and it's sitting there and probably didn't read any more than you did total out of that book. It's still like, I, I should probably read that, but who cares? Right. Right. And then this book comes along, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it's one of those things that pulls you in, right? It, it pulls you in to where your mind is just like magnetized towards it. Right. Like you're just pulled. you just, it just, it, it grabs you, man. It just like, and then you, did you start reading more after that? Like you started getting to work? No, <laughs> you didn't. Did you, no, I actually, where actually did you go I did. to learn after that? Like where, actually, where did I you did. go? I, but I did, but I said no, because the very first thing I did after I read Rich Dad Poor Dad is I went to go find business. I went to go find all the things he was talking about. I, I was looking at, I remember I was looking at a shipping container business. I was looking at lending club. I was looking at all these uh, just, just obscure business models that, that I was just into business all of a sudden I was just like man like I gotta I gotta go start something right so it wasn't about reading more but you know you, you mentioned the fact that Rich Dad Poor Dad is this book that I don't think you know in the next two or three generations there'll be another book like it um, but another book that had almost as equal as an effect on that on me as that book I read almost immediately after that was uh, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim mm -hmm. Ferriss and um, I said whoa I said, well, he's just planned out the rest of my life. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> I was like, thank you, Tim. You literally just planned out the rest of my life. And um, what happened after I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad is I, 
and, and hindsight is 2020, but for some reason I had some type of fortitude to look into the future and understand what most people were doing. Um, but I realized that if I read this book and I don't take immediate massive action, that I'm just going to be like everybody else. Again, if I don't take immediate massive action, then it's just going to be, oh, that was a great book. Yeah. So what I did is I went to go find real estate. I went to go find property. I had no zero idea what I was doing. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a course. I didn't have any of that. I had zero idea what I was doing, but I said, I must, I must. All right. You think about the word decide, right? When you, when I decided to become a real estate investor, I didn't, it wasn't an option. I, I knew after I read that book that this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. I knew immediately. So there's, there's no, there's no backup plan. There's no plan B. There's no if, ands, or buts. There was, this is what I'm doing. I could fail a million times, but I'm still going to do this. So I took immediate massive action. I went to go buy my first property less than 30 days after I read that book. 30 days. Wow. And I knew, I was like, man, this is going to be a bad deal. <laughs> so this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to be the stupidest was, thing I've ever was done. Was it a listed property? I mean, how'd you find it? Right. How it was did that list- quick? I mean, I would figure, yeah. Right. It was a listed property. Exactly. It was something that um, it was on the MLS. So it was something that there was no type of investor incentive whatsoever. <laughs> but but I knew I said, I said, I have to I have to dig in. I have to dig in. And I said, this is probably going to cost me a lot of money. Um, I'm going to have sleepless nights. It's going to be a bad deal, but I'm here to stay. You know, again, going back to the, the word decide, when you when you decide something, that means to cut off the possibility of anything else, right? The, the root word of decide, when you think about the, the, root, the root word IDE, and you think about um, what that means, again, it means to cut off, right? I think it's in Latin. Uh, so like pesticide, right? To kill off, right? Genocide, right? Um, trying to think of a few more, but it means to kill off. So when I decide there's no other possibility so again i was like okay well this is just going to be i'm just going to chalk this up to co- college tuition right i paid more in tuition than i'm going to pay to buy this mm. property so let's buy this property let's fail but at least i have the experience at least i have the resources i have the know-how i have the connections right i know what i did wrong the first time i could do that and replicate that 10 20 30 40 more times so let's just go ahead and fail on this first one <clears throat> I ended up buying that property. I think I used an FHA. It was either FHA or conventional. Um, and ultimately that property, and, and it's cash flowing to this day, that property ended up cash flowing for me immediately $300 a month or $250 a month at the time. Oh, nice. $250 a month. And I was just like, oh crap, I didn't fail. Guys, <laughs> newsflash. I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't fail. It worked. 30 days after I read my first book, Danny, I went on to read a book a week every single week till today <laughs> that was five uh, years ago um I, I've, I've skipped this this year has been i've been really really down on books but i'm i'm well over i'm probably close to 200 books at this point like yeah, i'm I a voracious that, reader yeah and there's there's a um there's an interesting there that I'm, I'm also a voracious reader but i do find myself you know more interested in in learning than than doing after a while and it's, it's like what you know that fire that got you going in the first place where it was like i'm not going to read it i need massive action nothing happens outside of action, right? That's the, that's the knowledge of the the books that we read in action produces the wisdom, right? Because you've gone through, you've had the actual experience yourself. You can go to seminars, you can go to all kinds of things and learn things, but you don't really truly get the experience without action. And, you know, I, I started at a young age as well. I'm assuming you were in your, your early twenties, right? Yep. And, uh, you know, starting over today, had I never done any of that and starting today, I wonder how it would be for me. Like, I think I would fall in the trap of, of really learning, 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 learning without taking action. And I, like you, whenever my first deal, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I, you know, I got it under contract and it was one of the first, I think it was the first one I went and got it under contract, pulled up to the, um, to the title company and, and called my dad and said, I have this contract and I'm at the title company, but I have no idea what I'm supposed to say when I go inside. Like, what am I supposed to do with this here? Do I just give it to them and they figure it out? Like, what, what am I supposed to, I didn't even know what to say. It's like the small yeah. little things, but, but. You know, uh, you know, what's crazy about that is most people would think about that horror, that, that fear before they even got the contract and mm-hmm. never get the contract. Right. 
let it right. stop them. Right. Like, I mean, again, that's that's what we're we're problem making machines. So a lot of people, they're, they're like, well, what if this happens or what if this happens? What if I don't know about, you know, what to do in this situation? Well, all those things are going to happen. They're going to come mm-hmm. up and, and the things you've never you... heard of before that they can't right. they don't have the time to teach you or even think to teach you at a seminar are going to happen. Right. 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 So you just have to know you just have to you have to know that it's going to be imperfect action. You have to know that at the end of the day, the entire thing is life is one big game. It's a learning process, right? Mm -hmm. And the only way that you're going to learn, you could watch boxing videos for a hundred hours. You could watch all the Muhammad Ali, all the, you could watch all the Joe for, you could watch all the fights. You could read all the manuals. You could be the most well-versed person when it comes to boxing education. And if you've never stepped in a ring, <laughs> the minute you step in that ring, you're going to get punched in the mouth, Yeah. right? So you have to get the experience. It's the only way to grow. And that's interesting because in this day and age, you think with the access to information, everybody has so much access to information that it would be wonderful, but it, it's scary because everybody's walking around. And I do this too. I'm not excluded from this comment, but we all walk around as if we know all of this stuff that we've read, heard, or whatever, you know, regarding anything, and then like to give our opinion on it as if we know mm. that from experience, right? Mm. There's so many things that we decides that we didn't see, the perspectives that we didn't see. And then we get all crazy about, you know, someone that says something from a different perspective because, you know, it's just it's it's a crazy thing. But but back to the the point here of this, this massive action and, and uh, not knowing what's going to happen, know that you're going to go into some moments where you have no idea what to do. Those are the memorable parts of life, right? Those are the moments where you are afraid, but you do it anyway. And then at the end you say, man, and you feel good because you didn't just execute something that you heard from somebody else and it worked out. Maybe that's exciting, but when you end up against some kind of situation where you have to, you know, use your intuition or use whatever you feel like you should do to do it. It's, it's like a whole new, another level of living, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, what, what's crazy is I, I did that, that first deal and I was just like, Oh my goodness, like, this is, this is amazing. Like I, I figured this out, but lo and behold, I, I told you, I, I did a lot of research on a lot of different businesses after I read a rich dad, poor dad. So I bought my first property, but at the same time, I started seven other businesses, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> I started. didn't know what I was doing. I was <laughs> taking massive, imperfect action. I had no idea what in the world was going on. I didn't know how to run a business. I knew nothing, nothing. I started seven other businesses. I started up, I had one of them. I still have to this day, my drop shipping store. I sell so high-end furniture. It's a drop shipping store. Oh, okay. I sell high-end furniture online. I still have it to this day. But the other ones, they fills it out almost immediately. I started a, a Kindle publishing business. I started a lead gen site. Like I was I, like anything that I saw on the internet, that if you were advertising to me back in 2015, I was gonna I was gonna click on your ad and I was gonna pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> like that was just, I was everything. It was like, yep, I can do that. I could do that too. I could do that too. I could do that too. Cause I I never wanted to feel the feeling of helplessness again. The, your boss tells you you're fired, like from your income source. What? Like this is my one source of income, and I and now I have nothing. I never wanted to feel that again, ever in my life. I said I'm gonna have so many legs under this table that no matter what happens, this table is always gonna be sturdy. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's two two ways to look at living your life, right? You can you can live it from a stance of I need security, I need safety, I need to you know, secure myself against anything that could happen to me. And then there's the, the go out there and, and face those and have that as, you know, the call to action, right? Like the call to adventure, the call to, to going out and taking charge, knowing that you could get punched in the face, but you're living life, right? You're, you're living in, in your, you're living. I mean, I think you're living two sides. Yeah. I mean, you can get (laughs) stuck and that's, you know, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, if that's, what you feel called to do. And maybe, you know, security is there because you've got a family and you feel like the security is the most important thing at this point in your life. But, you know, I, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting perspective to, to look at things that way. And, and I think that people, you know, considering getting into this business would do well to, to know that, 
you know, there, there is adventure on the other side of that, right? The, with that fear comes adventure, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And a, again, I think about the, those early stages and, you know, it's not all roses and peaches and cream, right? Like all of those businesses failed, every single one of them. Like I didn't understand, by the end of that year, I was flat broke. I was flat broke. Like I didn't understand there was something called marketing dollars. I didn't understand that to keep a well-lowered machine, like you needed to put money in to get money out. I didn't understand that you know I needed to advertise. I need to do this. I needed to have ads. And I, I, I mean, I was just like, whoa, like this is not as easy as I thought it was going to be. This is actually super hard. Like I got off to a great start buying my first property and opening up these businesses. But by the end, by December that year, I had no money, none. Mm. So I was just like, all right, well, Dre, what do you do? Like you've already decided this is your new path. And obviously you're doing something wrong. And again, I didn't have any mentors. I was just reading books. I was reading book after book after book, no mentors, no course. I took a lot of courses actually. I still take a lot of courses, um, but I didn't believe in mentorship. I didn't believe in the gurus. Like I was just like, this is a scam. I'm not gonna give you $20,000. You're never gonna get that out of me. Just go away. Like I just thought, no, there's no way. There's YouTube university. Why would I ever, ever give my money to somebody else when I can figure it out myself? I've always been that type of person. I'm self-sufficient, right? A lot of us are. After a while, you have to know what you don't know. And I needed to start changing the tune in my mindset towards mentorship because I wasn't figuring it out. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't. And when you're not figuring something out, what do you have to turn to? You can't, I mean, turning to another book is not gonna, it's not gonna give you the, um, it doesn't give you specifics on your exact situation. Right. Like it's not going to create a, it's not like a doctor who comes in and checks on you and gives you a, a, an exact prescription for what's going on with you. Right. It's other people telling you about their situations so of what's going on currently in this stage of their yeah, life. Yeah, there's there's no conversation. Right. There's no back and forth. There, there's right. no. No feedback. No feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just like, man, I, I need somebody to look at everything I have. I need to lay it on the table. I need somebody to tell me, all right, right. This is what you're doing wrong. This is what you need to do. Um, one day late in that December, um, I met up with a one day mentor, right? Nobody I paid or anything, but somebody through a family friend, he had started a few businesses and the family friend just thought it was a great idea to talk to him. So I talked to him and all he wanted to talk about was why am I starting all these businesses? Why don't I get funding for my business? Why don't I just go get funding for my business? Like, why do you keep bringing up? Like, I don't have the same type of business you have. There's no such, I can't raise money from people. Like you're starting, he was starting like a, a light manufacturing company or something. I was just like, we, this is not, I can't get funding. Like I, this doesn't make sense. But at the end of that conversation, I started to open my mind to the possibility of what he was saying. And maybe just switching the terms of what kind of how he looked at things. He was saying funding, right? There's no funding in real estate, really. Um, what I what I what I opened my mind to after that conversation, he has no real estate experience, but he helped me find how to buy properties with none of my own money. Because again, I ran out of money, and I wanted to quit my job. My whole goal was to quit my job in two years. Okay, I asked people at work around the Waterloo, hey, how long does it take for somebody to quit their job if they start investing in real estate? And Again, like you said earlier, I asked people at work, people who had never bought a, people, a piece of real estate before in their lives. Guess what they all told me? 10 to 15 years. I said, oh, wow. I said, it's about as long as I'm going to be here to make partner. And that's not going to, uh, no, no deal. I would ask investors, right? I would ask everyday people. I go to bigger pockets, like, hey, how long do you think it'll take me, you know, to, to quit my job? And these are people who have actually done a deal. So they said, oh, take a good five years. And the more and more people that I ask closer to, what I was actually doing, the time frame went down. And I realized that the first property that I bought, I think I put down like $18,000. And I was like, man, if I put down $18,000 to cash flow $300 a month, I need another, what, 19 more properties or 39 more properties if I want to get to 10K a month. I need another 39 more properties. That means I need another, let's just call it 20K. I need 20K times 39. Mm-hmm. What, Dore? Where are you gonna get them? what? <laughs> like, uh, I couldn't come up with another twenty k. Like, how am I gonna come up with thirty nine more? So I started to think, and I, again, I was just in a position. I started all these businesses that were failing. Um, I didn't know how to grow my real estate portfolio, and I had this conversation with this guy who knew nothing about real estate, but he was an entrepreneur and he was raising money from VCs. And I was just like, that's an interesting concept. 
So I went to go do my own research, but in the real estate world, and I found that there were many low and no, no money down strategies. So I was just like, well, this all seems really hard and complicated, but I went back to my experiences, okay? My background, and I'm saying this, and I'm emphasizing this for a reason. We all have experiences. And I always tell people when they get started, hey, it doesn't matter where you're starting from. It doesn't matter what your experience is. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what your goals are, right? What you need to understand is where all those things lie. Okay, how much money do I have? What are my experiences? What is my background, right? How much time do I have, right? Once you understand those things, you can start to create a strategy that fits what you have going on. Again, for my experiences, I was an auditor of some of the biggest real estate companies in the world. I knew how to read financial statements like the back of my head. So ultimately, when it came to investor reporting, when it came to a lot of the things that uh, syndicators do, I was already doing that for my investors on the corporate side. So I, the strategy that I leaned in to was syndication. I was like, okay, well, this looks like something I'd be interested in. I already know how to manage these large, apart large apartment portfolios from the financial side. I'm going to go and see if I can get in as an investor. How do I do this? I caved. I caved. I did the one thing I said I would never do. After I bought a few courses and I still wanted help, I said, hey, I need to go hire a mentor. I came up off that money. I never said I said I would never come off of. And I said, you know what? I need to do this. And did I have that money? No, I started eight businesses and I was flat broke in December. I didn't have the money. So I got on the phone with my first mentor. I'm sure you know him. His name is Joe Fearless. And I was like, Joe, I don't know about this. <laughs> He was like, well, DeRay, um, think about it this way. If you have, going back to that word decide, if you have made a decision that you are going to be a millionaire, you're going to be a real estate investor, you're going to do this for the rest of your life, what's 10, 15, 20K today in the grand scheme of things? What, I mean, if, if not, now, if you're not going to take any action or if you think you're going to fail, yeah, that's a lot of money and you probably don't want to give up that money. But if you know that this is what you're going to do and you're going to be successful. I mean, your decision point here tells me and you yourself, tells you to yourself all we need to know. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow. I was like, you're right. Credit card this up. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I was like, you're right. Credit card this up. Let's do this. And um, that, that began my syndication journey. And that was chapter two. So when I was an auditor, I, um, I, again, I was looking at financial statements in arrear. So I was looking at what happened in the past and I was reporting on that. So again, this has nothing to do with the future. Like you can't, this is not forecasting. I was like, well, I need more experience. And I read in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, I, you know, these books are coming in handy. I read in Rich Dad, Poor Dad. They, they said, hey, if you want to go get specialized education, don't pay for it. Find a way to make them pay you. I was like, right. So don't go to grad school to learn how to financial forecast go get a financial job instead of a accounting job and let them pay me to learn what I need to learn to be an investor. I said, OMG. Mm -hmm. You did it. So I went to go get a job as an investment analyst. Now I'm looking at numbers in the future. Now I'm forecasting. Now I'm looking at financial models. So I'm getting both sides of experience. So as I'm becoming a syndicator, I'm far and ahead of, where, uh, ahead of my peers who are just now starting their syndications. I mean, they're, you know, they're starting their, their programs with their mentors and all of that. Like, I'm, I'm a step ahead of everybody. So I was like, man, I'm going to kill this. So I hired this guy. I was like, all right. Gave him all my money, money I didn't have. But I've decided this is what I'm going to do. Our very first call I was like, all right, Joe, like, I'm ready. What I got to do, like, you know, lay it out for me. I'm gonna be this big syndicator. I'm gonna, you know, make millions of dollars. I'm gonna change the world, change the game. Like, it feels good. What you got for me? He said, all right, Derek, here's what I want you to do first. I want you to go and create a platform. Crickets. I had to think about what he said. <laughs> I said, what? I said, Joe, like, I just hired you to be my real estate mentor. Like teach me how to buy these large apartment buildings and let's go make this money. He said, no, 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 right. take a step back. Like, I need you to create what's called a thought leadership platform first. I, 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 agony. I was in agony. I was like, Joe, like, what are you talking about? I just gave you all this money. Stop playing with me. 
He said, just, just, just trust me. Go and create this platform. Once you're done creating the platform, we'll get to the next step. It's like, all right, whatever. I paid him this money. I might as well do what he says. So I start to think, how am I, what, what's the platform? How do I, what, what's the, why am I doing this? What's the, what's the thing behind this? So I started to think, all right, maybe I'll create like a, a real estate form uh, similar to bigger pockets and that'll be the platform. I was like, well, I got to go get a designer, not a designer, um, a developer and, you know, do all these things. I was like, well, that's, that's super complicated. I know it'd be dope, but uh, I want something easier. I was like, well, I don't want to do what my mentor is doing. He has a podcast. I definitely don't want to do that. Um, so what about YouTube? or blogs. And I checked out some of those things like, well, I don't want to be on video all the time. And uh, I don't want to always be obligated to write. And I just started canceling things out. And eventually I circled back to the one thing I said I wouldn't do, which is what my mentor did. And I started a podcast. That podcast, as you know, Danny, you've been on it. It's called Before the Millions. I started that podcast four or five years ago because I was forced to. <laughs> Interesting. So what was the approach? Why, why, why did he have you do that first? All right. Um, so the whole idea, right, as a syndicator, you are literally raising money, okay? So my, my mentor's business model, he has a partner. His partner is the one who kind of does the behind the scenes, the underwriting, the number crunching, the finding of the deals and all of that. And my mentor, his job was to raise the money for the deals, okay? So again, this is a no and low money down strategy where you don't have to, in a lot of the cases, you are bringing your own money, but you don't have to bring your own money to deals as long as you have investors who are able to help you buy those deals. Okay, so ultimately, there were two partners in my in my um, mentor's business, one was bringing and finding and taking down the deals, the other one was bringing all the money for the deal. So as the money bringer, you almost have to be a, you have to be a personality, right, you have to, you have to be resourceful, you have to be well networked, right. And the best way to do that is to talk to investors to talk to people who want to be investors every single day. Mm -hmm. right to put your face out there to put your voice out there so that was all he i mean he has what the longest running real estate daily real estate running yeah. podcast in, in the world because he knows how to attract investors okay so that's all he wanted me to do is he wanted me to build my 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 what is it like my honeycomb my 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 trap what i don't know what you want to call it but he wanted me to build my structure so that i had somewhere for people to come to and ultimately that's what i built i built before the millions and it started off as a podcast, right? I didn't know it was going to grow to be an educational company. I didn't know I was going to, you know, mentor and coach all these people. I didn't know we were going to do hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales. I had no idea. I was mad. And you didn't even really need to know all the things on the podcast because you interview people that knew the right. topics, right? Right. Like Russell Brunson says, I wasn't, I wasn't the hero in the story. I was a reporter. I didn't do anything yet. I was just reporting on what other people did. Right. So you don't again, when if you're you guys are just starting out, you think that you need to know all these, you need to be well versed and educated in all these things. No, you just need to be able to take again, going back to the theme of this, it's already been massive, massive incorrect action sometimes. Because it is all about the journey more than it is the destination, right? I mean, you know, a lot of us get into it for the destination, but really what what it's all about is this journey of this like ever evolving you know, journey that you're on. And, it, and I'm sure when you first read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you didn't think you'd be doing all of this. Not, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. I mean, it, it, again, I, I read that book and I was just dumbfounded. I was just like, man, this is, this is, this is crazy talk. Like, there's no way, there's no way I can, I can buy. I remember um, before, uh, right after I hired Joe, I was still looking for my own deals and doing my own deals, like on the side, like smaller, you know, single family, small multis. And um, right around that time, I had bought a fourplex. And I remember, again, going back to the concepts in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I was just like, man, like, okay, so I buy this property, going and going back to how I wanted to live my ultimate life, own lifestyle, I buy this property, and I, um, I move into one of the units, okay? So I, ma I make a purchase, I move into one of the units, and the total gross amount of rent covered in all the other units. So I think um, at the time it was maybe uh, 34, uh, um, 40, no, $4,300, okay? Was how much the gross rents were for the other three units combined. My mortgage was $3,400. So I move, I buy, okay. I'm, this, this fascinates me to today. Cause I'm like, guys, if you get this, like this is, this is what, what literally took my investing to the next level. Mm -hmm. I'm currently renting, let's just say I was renting at $1,500 a month, my apartment. 
So every single month I'm throwing away $1,500 just to extend the stay at this apartment for 30 days. When I buy a property and I do what's called house hack, right? I buy a four unit building, I move into one of the units and the other three units are filled with tenants. Now I'm collecting $4,300 a month, but I'm only expensing $3,400 a month. So first off, the $1,500 a month that I was expensing before that I was paying before, I'm no longer paying that. People forget about that, that sunk cost. Like that cost is gone. It disappeared. So that's $1,500 plus now. Not only that, but the, in the $4,300 that I'm collecting, I'm getting $1,100 of that in cash flow. So I'm getting paid to live for free. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm getting paid to live for free. Now, the other $3,400 in that, that's going towards my mortgage principal and interest. So my principal is going down by the tenants. They're paying that. They are paying down my mortgage. Yeah, They're paying the cash flow yeah. and I'm living for free. So when I used to go on trips, I used to go on trips for a day or two or three days. I used to have to worry about, man, like I got to pay, you know, for this hotel. I also got to pay rent. It's due on the first of every single month. So I'm, I'm double taxation. Now I'm living for free. Why not go on a trip for a month? Why not go on a trip for two months? There's nothing tying me to any single place now. I'm living for free. I'm actually getting paid to live for free. So I could actually use the excess and pay for my hotel or pay for my Airbnb. My, 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 my entire living situation changed at that point. And it was the most freeing thing I could have ever done, right? So again, when, when I think about the early stages and how to set that foundation, um, that's another lesson, man. Like starting out with some type of house hack, right? So starting out trying to figure out how to eliminate expenses before making money, I think is the best and easiest way to go to get started. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's huge. And yeah, that, I mean, that, if that doesn't fire you up, anybody listening out there, you know, just that idea that that is possible, then, you know, it's time to look at different businesses because <laughs> that's what, that's what this, is, this is all about. This is the beauty of this whole industry, right? I mean, this whole approach to creating a business to create financial freedom uh, for yourself. Thank you so much for being on the show, Dore. Uh, if anybody out there is listening, wants to find out more or, you know, get in touch with you, how can they, they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I appreciate you for having me on and again, uh, man, we barely even just scratched the surface in, yeah. my, in my journey. And yeah, uh, I, I definitely suggest you guys, uh, if you want to learn more here about the journey, um, I, um, my first apartment, uh, deal was a 304 unit apartment complex in a suburb of Dallas called Louisville. And I was in charge for raising a million dollars. And um, I'll just make this short because it's the end. But ultimately, yeah. um, I did not raise that million dollars for my first deal. At the same time, I was coming out with a course I'd house hacked by about three times at this time. I was coming out with the course and I thought, man, this course is going to blow up. Um, so I had this deal going and I was about to uh, make a ton of money on this course. And all of a sudden, at my second job, right, where I'm, you know, an investment analyst, they call me into the office and they close the blinds and they run through the spiel again. I was like, Are this, is this happening again? <laughs> but the, sec the second time I was, well, I was way, way more prepared. And ultimately, um, I used my real estate investments at the time, right, to propel myself into other investments. But again, I thought that with this large apartment deal and with this course that I was going to be okay if I did get fired. I ended up getting fired. But I raised zero dollars for that for that um, for that apartment, zero dollars. And there's a ton of stories in there we can definitely pull out if, if we, uh, we we do a part two or whatever. But zero dollars, my course, my first course, zero dollars. Yeah. And I got fired and I got fired. So I was just like, man, this is crazy. But it, anyways, what, what ended up happening is I realized that the syndication route wasn't for me. And um, I started finding different um, creative ways to buy deals. And today I buy all my deals uh, with owner financing uh, subject to, and you guys may not know what these terms are, but again, these are no and low money down strategies. That's my, last month I bought a property for $10, nice. $10. And I'm set to make about 65 grand on it. So just to kind of let you guys know that there, I, I went through a ton of different routes to finally end up where I am to figure out what my strategy is. And um, I would love to help all the listeners not go through so many mistakes, not go through so many routes, right? So I have a, a freebie. It's a guide. It's an assessment for yourself to really just help you figure out everybody's different, right? I mean, I have a podcast and you have a podcast. There's a ton of investors. I mean, there's a million ways to make money in real estate, right? There's land investors, there's fixers and flippers, there's, you know, buy and hold, there's node investing, there's mobile home parks, right? It all makes money. There's millionaires in every single one of those niches. So I always like to say, don't put the focus on the podcast that you're listening to or the person that you met at, at the meetup, right? 
put your focus on yourself. What are your resources? Again, what are your, what are your time limitations, right? What's your background? <laughs> Once you put all those things together, you can kind of figure out, all right, well, maybe I should be a passive investor on an apartment, or maybe I should actually uh, be a full-time wholesaler, whatever the case may be. So I have a free guide to really help people navigate that process. And again, my path is not, may not be for, for you. I mean, my oh, Danny's path may not be for you, but if you can figure out ultimately what works for you, you can waste so many years of wasted missed opportunities mm-hmm. and mistakes. Uh, that guide is over at beforethemillions.com forward slash G-U-I-D-E. That's beforethemillions.com forward slash G-U-I-D-E. And beforethemillions.com is my main central hub where you can find my podcast and all the other things that we get into. I'd love to help and be a conjugate and a resource to help you guys get on your journey. If not, go further faster. Man, that sounds like a great resource because, you know, in the beginning, like you said, there's so many different things that you could get into. It's hard to pick the right one. I love your advice on, on find something that fits you and your experience, your history, all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody listening, go check that out. And thanks so much for providing that. Thanks for sharing your story. And, you know, really it's inspiring. Like this whole conversation has been super inspiring, inspiring um, with, you know, what it's like to, to get fired up about something and then take that action without, you know, too much concern about making a mistake. Cause you know, you're going to make a mistake and getting there and doing that. Thanks a lot, Dory. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. All right, man. Keep in touch. We'll talk soon. Yes, sir.